Hi everyone, welcome back. I'm Professor Rhett Smith for ProtonGuru.com and we're covering lesson 5.4 today. In 5.4 we introduced some organopalladium complexes. Now organopalladium complexes can undergo reversible oxidative addition with various organic compounds such as aryl halides as illustrated here. I want to point out that this is a palladium compound that has some ligands on it already. These are neutral phosphine ligands. If you drew one of these out, it would look like this. Phosphorus with three of these phenyl groups. Phenyl being the abbreviation for benzene, if it's used as a substituent. So the pH, if you haven't covered benzene compounds in your course yet, looks like that. But this lone pair on the phosphorus is attracted to the palladium. Also, similarly to magnesium, the palladium is going to insert into the aryl halogen bond, kind of like when you're making a Grignard reagent. The result is that the palladium has not only these neutral phosphine ligands that I mentioned, but also an aryl and an X ligand. Now the aryl and the X would both be considered negative one ligands, so the palladium, which is zero oxidation state to start, is now a plus two oxidation state. It was oxidized upon addition, so it's an oxidative addition. Now, in this case, unlike the Grignard reagent case, this is a reversible process. So you can take the palladium complex and release the aryl X group and remake the palladium zero compound. The reversible nature of this process makes it a good candidate for catalytic CC bond forming reactions that we're gonna cover in this lesson. So as you'll see, many of these reactions are extremely useful. In fact, three people who did work in this palladium catalyzed CC bond coupling chemistry have won the Nobel Prize in chemistry recently. So how can we use the fact that palladium can undergo oxidative addition and then release the compounds by a reductive elimination process in a catalytic way? Well here's a generalized sort of scheme one could envision when planning something like this. So you could start with any metal, in this case let's say it's palladium. In this case let's say the N is the zero oxidation state of palladium. Well if we have XA where A is some organic piece and we can do oxidative addition. The X and the A both go in the metal, and the metal is oxidized to M, N plus one, so like a palladium two. We've also seen that metals can do things like ligand exchange and transmetallation, which would allow you to exchange some of the ligands on the metal. In this case, we have ligands A and B on the metal. We had A already, so X was exchanged for this piece Z. Now the specific identity of A, B, and Z depend on the specific reaction we're looking at. We're just trying to get an idea of how this might work. Well, once we have two pieces, let's say they're organic pieces, organic piece A and organic piece B. Remember, we said the oxidative addition was reversible. So once we have pieces A and B on the metal, we can do a reductive elimination. That's the reverse of oxidative addition. This could get us the two organic pieces hooked together and regenerate our metal complex, which could then do oxidative addition again, have the ligand exchange or transmetallation step, reductive elimination, and keep going around this catalytic cycle. So since palladium can do this process, it can become very useful for some specific types of reaction. The first of these is the Kamada coupling reaction. And the unique thing about each of these specific named reactions like the Kumada reaction are the two pieces that eventually get put together. If we look back at our general scheme, pieces A and B get put together, and we start with an X on part A and a Z on part B. So the identities of X and Z are going to change a and B are going to stay being organic pieces in all these reactions. In the Kamada coupling, we take an RX group, where R can be an aryl, like I'm going to show in this example, a benzyl, and a benzyl is a benzene with a CH2 attached to it like that, that's a benzyl group, vinyl, which is this, and the leaving group X could be a triflate, chlorine, bromine, or iodine, typical leaving groups we've seen in other types of chemistry. Now the other piece that you need is actually a Grignard reagent. Our goal is to take the R group from the magnesium and the R group with the leaving group and attach them to each other. So in this way, you can look at the catalytic cycle and see the first thing that happens is oxidative addition of this group to the palladium. So the X and the aryl attach to the palladium. And now the magnesium has a very strong attraction for the halogen. It will form a stronger bond with the halogen than the palladium has, or whatever the leaving group is. So it pulls that group off the palladium and exchanges that X group for the other R group. Now we have an aryl group and an R group in the palladium. Well, it undergoes reductive elimination to attach the R group to the aryl group. 
regenerating the catalyst and can go around and around. Let's consider the specific example. We have phenyl magnesium chloride with 4 iodotoluene. Now 4 iodotoluene, for those who haven't looked at naming aromatic compounds yet, looks like this. What you want to look at is that the magnesium chloride is going to be stealing the I, right, to generate this type of compound down here. So we should get magnesium chlorine it already had, iodine it took from the iodotoluene. Then the two R groups should also go together. The phenyl should go onto this piece. So we have phenyl attached to the iodotoluene. In this way, this piece was right here, and the phenyl group was right here, and there's a new carbon-carbon bond between those two pieces. These reactions typically work at relatively mild conditions and in very good yields with a catalytic amount of the palladium compound needed. So even though palladium compounds are kind of expensive, if it's only a catalyst that can be reused over and over again, it's not going to contribute a tremendous amount to the cost of the final product, making this reaction very useful. The second of these reactions is called the Heck reaction. And the Heck reaction actually couples an alkene with an R with a leaving group. The R again could be an aromatic group, a benzyl group, a vinyl group. And the X again, just like in the Kamada coupling, could be one of these leaving groups. And what's going to happen is we're going to take the X, the leaving group, off of the one piece. So X. And the H, one of the H's, right? We have several H's on this alkene. Take one of the H's off and we'll get these two compounds so that this fragment forms a carbon-carbon bond with this piece. The bond is formed to the alkene wherever you have the H leaving. Generally, you want to take the H that is as far away from the existing R group as possible if there's some non-hydrogen R group on there, just so that you have the least steric hindrance between the two in the major product. So even without having a look at the catalytic cycle that I'll show you on the next page, we could look at the leaving group on this piece, and we say, oh, this is the least sterically hindered hydrogen on this molecule in the coupling partners. And one thing you'll notice is that with a palladium catalyzed coupling, we have this extra reagent in addition to the catalyst. Well, we make HX, where HX is some type of strong acid, like hydrochloric acid, hydrobromic acid, hydroiodic acid. This amine is a relatively good organic base. And that triethylamine will pick up a proton from that strong acid and make the ammonium salt, and the X minus will be the counter anion. So here we have the HOTF. HOTF that will actually be neutralized by this base. We'll just leave it like this for now to keep track of the pieces. And then we have this piece here, which I will draw in box B. And attached to the site where the leaving group departed is now the alkene attached at the least hindered of the H's that you can take off. So we would have a compound like this as our product. And this type of reaction, these palladium catalyzed coupling reactions, are typically pretty functional group tolerant which means you have other functional groups like esters or ethers or alcohols or amines on these coupling partners without it interfering with the reaction. Here we have ethylene. Now all those H's are equivalent because the molecule is symmetric this way and this way. So we'll just draw in one random hydrogen and that will be taken off with the leaving group. So we have this entire fragment attached to this fragment. So if we draw those in, I start with that blue piece. Here's where the iodine had been. So I'm going to attach my next piece there. And that next piece is just a vinyl group in this case. And then we have the H and the I, which again would be neutralized by the amine. Well, if you refer to our general scheme for how these catalytic reactions work, you can see the oxidative addition step, where the platinum can insert into the XR bond and give you a complex like this. And then you have to have the H go with the X. So there's an exchange of ligands so that the alkene and the R group attach the palladium. Then when you do the reductive elimination, you'll have the R group where this H used to be, and you'll regenerate your catalyst. And that's how the cycle will be able to continue going over and over again. Now the Kamada coupling requires a Grignard reagent. We learned about Grignard reagents and how they can be pyrophoric. They can catch fire in the air. They're kind of hard to handle. And then with the heck reaction, you need an alkene as one of your two coupling partners. So you're a little bit limited in what kind of pieces you can stick together, and you're kind of limited if you don't want to handle these pyrophoric Grignard reagents. So Professor Stilley invented a reaction 
where you can take an R with a leaving group on it, and now you have some different R group, which could be an aryl group, a benzyl group, or a vinyl group again. It doesn't have to be an alkene. And you can couple two of these pieces together if on one of these pieces you have a tin. Now the tin has to have alkyl groups. You'll notice the R groups that can be coupled together can't be alkyl groups. The alkyl groups will always stay on the tin. Butyl groups are very common. Octyl groups are very common but some alkyl groups. So up here in our general scheme, I'll say three alkyl groups, and all the alkyl groups will stay on the tin in all cases. Here's the general scheme. A lot of times you'll see this drawn with THF, that stands for tetrahydrofuran. That's just used as a solvent, it doesn't play a role in adding atoms to the products. So if you see a stilly coupling like this one, you identify the leaving group, it's going to go with the tin. So you have this tin with all of its alkyl groups attached to the OTF, the triflate piece. That will be a salt that you're going to want to remove from the target product, generally. And then we have this blue piece that I'll draw in. And importantly, wherever the tin is attached is where you're going to hook that other piece onto the blue piece. So you see that the tin piece is trans to this benzene ring down here. So we have to make the trans configuration here as well, and that would be our product. Now this shows you that you can couple an alkene with an aryl group, but we could also couple an aromatic group to another aromatic group, something that's not possible with the Heck reaction. We can take this piece, draw that in box C. Here is where the iodo group had been attached, so we're going to attach this other benzene ring, and this would be our product of the stilly coupling. Mechanistically, this looks a lot like the other reactions we've seen. You have the oxidative addition where the X and the R go onto the palladium. You have a transmetallation. Tin, SN, is a metal, so it trades the X piece onto the tin, the R prime group onto the palladium. And now you have two organic groups on the palladium so that when you do reductive elimination, they attach to each other and you get your catalyst back. Now you can also couple an alkyne to an alkyl halide in what is called the Sonogashira reaction. The Sonogashira reaction couples a terminal alkyne by taking its hydrogen away with some type of R with a leaving group, and the identities of the R and leaving group resemble the same ones we saw for the HEC. So if we have a reaction like this, we can identify the leaving group, we can find the terminal site of the alkyne, we can first draw in this piece, it's a benzene with three methyl groups, and attached to this position will be this group, which has lost its terminal H of the terminal alkyne, isopropyl group. You have the H and the I, and again, because you've made the strong acid, a lot of times you'll add an amine as a base in this reaction. You'll also notice that to get this reaction going, you need some copper. So both the palladium and the copper are required for this mechanism. Again, you can have different functional groups, not just alkyl, aryl, and alkene or alkyne type units. You can have things like this OCH3 ether group here, but to figure out how you couple the two, you identify the leaving group and the terminal group. So we can draw in our first group that has the OCH3. I'll just draw it like that. Here's where the bromine was attached. So that's where the alkyne has to hook on. This alkyne happens to be the CC triple bond with this trimethyl silyl group. So you get a product like this. Mechanistically looks a lot like the other reactions we've seen. Oxidative addition of the aryl X goes onto the palladium. Here I've still shown the ligands, the phosphine ligands that are also attendant to that. One part of the process that I'm not really showing here is that the alkyne actually attaches to that copper. I mentioned that you need copper there. And it's that copper involved in the reaction that can steal the halogen from the palladium. So the copper has the halogen and that is the transmetallation step that allows the entire piece of the alkyne, that was the terminal alkyne, to attach to the palladium. Now you have two organic pieces attached to the palladium, such that reductive elimination produces the coupled product with a new carbon-carbon bond. There are many, many palladium catalyzed coupling reactions, but the last one I want to talk about is the Suzuki reaction. Let's say you want to couple two aromatic groups together, but you don't want to use a pyrophoric Grignard reagent. And you can't use Sonogashira or Heck because those couple alkyne to 
to a different piece or alkene to a different piece, respectively. And let's say you don't want to use the Stelly reaction because one thing I didn't mention is that the tin reagents that are required for the Stelly reaction can actually be pretty toxic. So Professor Suzuki did a lot of work to use these boron reagents. The boron has these two oxygens. Could be oxygens with some sort of big kind of complex looking R group, or it could just be OH groups. That piece is going to stay together. The oxygen boron bond is pretty strong. Then on the other piece, you're going to need a leaving group. So the net reaction for the Suzuki coupling is you have something attached to an oxygen, two units on a boron. That piece kind of sticks together. That has one piece, which could be an aryl, a benzyl, or a vinyl type group. Then you have another piece, let's say R prime with some sort of leaving group. And these leaving groups, the halogens, are useful. You'll notice that the tostyl or triflate groups aren't included here. But the net result, again, is going to be that you attach the two organic pieces together as the organic product, as shown in this sort of generic scheme. So in this first case, these two pieces, the leaving group and the boron group, those will go together. But we're usually asked about and are interested in the organic piece. So let's draw in that piece there. And where does the next piece attach? Well, the leaving group on this piece was trans to this piece, right? So we have this is where the leaving group, the bromine, had been attached. That's where I'm going to make a bond to the carbon that used to be attached to the boron. In this case, that just has a benzene group. So we have a phenyl substituent there. And that's our final product. Likewise, in the second reaction before box C, if we take the group that's a benzene ring that happens to have an ester functional group on it, which I'll draw it like that, here's where its leaving group was attached, this iodine, right? So that's where we're going to attach the new group at the carbon that used to be on the boron. Keep in mind that the bond formed is always between the carbon with the leaving group and the carbon with the boron in this case, or the tin in the case of a stilly, things like that. So that if I had another group that was, say, one carbon in between the boron and the methyl group, here's where I attached. That methyl group would be here, one carbon away from the attachment site. Mechanistically, the Suzuki reaction, again, looks exactly like the other ones we've seen. You have an oxidative addition, so that the palladium can insert in between the X and the R. Again, you could have different phosphine ligands or things on the palladium as well. These are the ligands of interest. So that the transmetallation with the boron stealing the halogen away leads to two organic groups on the palladium so that when they are reductively eliminated, you get a CC bond formed and regenerate your palladium catalyst. Many of these catalytic CC bond forming reactions can use one mole of catalyst to make thousands or even tens of thousands of moles of product. And many of them work in room temperature. Some of these even work in water as a solvent. So you're not using environmentally detrimental solvents for these reactions. And these are just a couple reasons that you can see for why these reactions become so important, leading to three people winning a Nobel Prize for this type of work.